All right. Today is special for two reasons. One, I've got Greg, who goes by Gordo Gordon. So we'll be calling him Gordo for the day. But today is also my four-year anniversary of this podcast. Four years ago, I released the same uh, first episode, and we now you, you will be episode 255. We've done 255 of these over four years. So we're going to have an awesome conversation today. Greg, oop, I already made a mistake. Gordo. <laughs> It's something that Wait, I've been, do we clap and I'm, celebrate the four year let, part. Yeah, now? let's like, clap. Everybody on. clap. I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Um, Gordo is somebody that I've actually admired from afar. Uh, we've been in the same industry for a while and we've spoken at events together and we've gotten to know each other a little. I know we're going to get to know each other better today, but um, you're somebody that I really have admired for leadership, culture, just the business that you built. And I think that'll resonate in today's episode. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Mutual respect there. Too. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Let's just start off with uh, how you got in this industry. You're third generation in the construction industry. How did you get so lucky to be third generation in the construction industry? It's uh, I'm addicted to pain and chaos. <laughs> it's a genetic disorder. Um, actually, it's a great question. Um, there's always a story behind uh, most of my answers. Uh, my dad worked for his father on the East Coast, and they had a design build construction company. Um, my dad wanted to be an architect and help that business. And so after I was born, I was four years old, my dad went back to architecture school, which if you know anything about being an architect is no joke, mm -hmm. let alone being a father of four. And so I joke and tell everyone I've been on the board since I was four years old. Uh, my dad, at the time, it was all hand drawings, and I would help him finish his projects by drawing in the lines on uh, the drawings down in the basement. Um, family businesses are messy, and uh, my dad got an opportunity to relocate us from Baltimore, Maryland in 1982 to go work for one of Trammell Crow's original partners. And so my dad thought he was going to be an architect and he ended up being a developer. I thought I was going to be a musician and I ended up in construction. And uh, <laughs> my dad has uh, been there along the way, just encouraging me and believing in me, which I think is really very powerful. And uh, although I'm not a developer, um, I did end up in the business. And so that's why I say I'm a third generation builder. Got it. Um, let's explain a little bit about what y'all do today at, uh, Gordon Highlander. Yeah. So, uh, we started the business in the industrial market space doing finish out, tenant finish out work. And at the time, you know, my thesis was the waves were good and there weren't a whole lot of surfers out there. Mm. And, uh, it's just fascinating what's happened in that market space in the last 16 years. And. Um, what I learned and saw was a bunch of lifestyle businesses out there, owner operators, five to 10 employees, really one person making good income. And um, as the marketplace started to change, we were aggressive in trying to offer a mid-market solution. And so we grew our business and industrial grew at the same time. So we're the beneficiary of the marketplace changing around us. Mm. Um, as we uh, built our identity and brand and industrial, some of our legacy clients, Crow Holdings is one of them, uh, said, hey, you know, we need you to do a finish out over here at Old Parkland. And so we went next into the double class A corporate interiors marketplace. Um, and then as our roots got deeper, uh, people would leave one firm and they'd go to another. And so Neil Richards was a group that um, started doing medical office. I mean, med uh, excuse me, hospital development. So we got into medical office. And so up till about three years ago, we really just grew in all the verticals relative to lease finish out. Mm -hmm. And then in 2020, uh, we were doing a, a huge job at DFW Airport for Amazon, and um, it was a $95 million, 1 million square foot finish out. That was four times the value of the tilt wall. And I had told my team at the time that I thought that that was going to change everything. 
And so about a month later, Amazon called and said, we'd like for you to get into the build suit business with us. And so that was the next logical step for us. Um, so we started a tilt wall and shell construction side of our business three years ago. And then last year, we expanded into both uh, Austin and Houston and really just trying to take the legacy client expansion method. You know, hey, we're over here now. So, if, you know, if we can help you in Austin or Houston. So it's been, it's been our trajectory. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about the business, but before we do that, we have to. Your company is called Gordon Highlander, mm. and I think the audience needs to understand what is a Gordon Highlander. Who are all these folks that are doing all this amazing construction work? What is a Gordon Highlander? Uh, another wonderful story. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's it's fascinating. Now I, I kind of reflect back and just, I just feel like I'm lucky. Um, when a, a business owner goes to start their business, there's just so much of a learning curve in terms of how to name it and what the what the uh, what the logo is and what are the colors and what's the story and how does that all weave together? Well, um, the Gordon Highlanders are a regiment of the Scottish Army that were formed in the late 1700s, and um, I was born into a family of historians. My dad actually was a history major before he went to work in the family business. And my grandmother worked at the Maryland Historical Society. Mm. And she had, and it's amazing. There's all these wonderful tools out there now, but the tools haven't done any more for us or any less than what she had done, you know, in the 60s and 70s researching our family. And so as a little kid, I knew I had, there, there was this connection to this army in my family, and I was disillusioned. I thought that someday I could go show up in Scotland, and somehow I would be received and knighted, <laughs> and all this crazy stuff would happen. <laughs> and so we took the family name and put it on the business, but we did it with that military pedigree. Mm. Um, the Highlanders, Winston Churchill said, were, were the greatest regiment that there ever was. They're like the special forces to the British Army, and it. And if you're looking for them today, when you see the queen or the king, um, the Highlanders are the ones that escort them that are in the full regalia. They're in their kilt uh, or they're playing their bagpipe. I love it. All right. Now, jumping back, we're going to we're going to start with um, I want to work up to what we just talked about with Amazon doing a ninety five million dollar interior finish out, which I think you said was three times out of the tilt wall. Was it four times? Four, four times. But I want to then start back in 2007. You gave a talk that I was listening to. Maybe it was a BizNow event or something. Let's just spend some time on like how has industrial finish out evolved in the last 16 years? Where did we start in 2007? And then when you said there's now a, a turning point in this industry, like how we got to today and what you've seen along the way. Yeah. Uh funny little story i'll never forget i was a superintendent on the job and this was like uh, mid 2000s and we were doing the color selections and we had a carpet book and it was already built for us uh so the the asset management group had three carpet colors there was blue tan and gray and a small uh metal fab shop and the guy had a, a dog that he had in the office and we went to do the carpet color selections and he called his dog in, pulled some <laughs> fur off of it and he laid it down on top of the carpet and he goes, it's the tan one right there. <laughs> <laughs> that like memorialized this part of the industrial story that I think is important because in 2007, uh, everyone kind of had an attitude about, you know, the office shouldn't be any more than 10% of the total amount of square footage. Most of the users were in the distribution business. Manufacturing was a little more rare. E-commerce didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And um, there were just old, noisy lights in the warehouse. Um, and so it's been, it's been wonderful to see how that's evolved and changed. And it's funny how much uh, the followers resist the change. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, we're never going to go to these tube fluorescent bulb lights and 
I don't know if you remember, but the the tube lights didn't even last that long. I mean, we went straight to LEDs, mm. and and then what? Automatic sensors, no light switches. I just remember like figuring out how to appropriately switch the warehouse lights was just like such a big deal. If you screwed that up, it really really aggravated the end user, mm. um, and all that stuff. Just the automation. Um, I think along the way to this is, this is just my thesis, uh, uh, businesses started to want to kind of smush everyone together. They didn't like their office headquarter in the central business district and their warehouse and manufacturing, you know, out in an industrial park. And so when I really started to pick up on this is when we started doing what I'm calling double class A office finish outs in warehouses mm. and they were smushing it all together. Yep. And that was just the CEO deciding we're all going to work together. That we're not going to have an ivory tower and and something else. And I think there was good economics behind it too. You yeah. know, like, hey, this is five bucks a foot rent, and that's thirty five bucks a foot. When did that start? Uh, that started. That started in the teens. Okay. Yeah, I think that started kind of thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay. Okay. So so they're coming at you, and and that level. So. How how much did office expand? Was it still 10% or did it now go to 20 or 30? And what else changed about the building besides just the really nice finish outs? Yeah, so the, the office square footage grew. Okay. Um, kind of the company functions grew then within that office footprint. So we started building really, really sophisticated break rooms that could double down for all hands on deck meetings. We started putting cafes that were automated in these break rooms. Um, and I, I would tell you now, looking back, I think that's when the employer grew in sophistication relative to attracting talent and making sure that the people were important to the business. Yep. And I think that's also when the employees started to become more aware how important they were to the business. Mm. And so... Up to that point, it was rare for us to air condition a warehouse. When we'd get the change order to air condition the warehouse, it was like a big win for us because it was big dollars and three trades. Yep. And I go like, guys, this is this is scale. Like we can, we, we don't have to micromanage all this information and this is $3 million worth of work. Yep. And now I think an air conditioned warehouse is kind of the norm for at least the big the big deals that we see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, before we get to where we are with Amazon today, I think well, I think it's important to, when we're thinking about these big projects, when do you need to be involved? So I, I haven't developed warehouses. We just buy existing warehouses, but in a prior life, we did build a lot. Mm -hmm. And I want to spend a little time on uh, the, the worst deals we ever did and the most pain was when we had an architect who designed something without in a silo, without MEPs and contractors involved. And this set of plans was kind of passed around. Nobody really took accountability for what was there. And then you start building and that's when you start realizing where all the errors are. So I want to spend some time going. If I'm a client and I'm thinking about doing something, whether it's a finish out or just ground up, when should I be thinking about talking to you and who should you be talking to while we're doing what we'll call pre-development, pre-construction work? I think over the last, really the last three years since the pandemic, we've talked a lot. We've encouraged the marketplace a lot in this way, mm -hmm. like the sooner, the better. Um, and, and I do believe that the market is listening. There's just, it's been tough on construction uh, cost has been a big problem. And then, uh, time has been a big problem, which those are the two basic fundamentals of our business. It's been hard mm. and times I'm really having to encourage my team cause they're exhausted cause they, they, they're used to being able to give their word and hit the target. And now things are just still bumpy and all over the place. And so the more collaboration that you can have, the more people that you can have listening to the end user or the developer, the more questions you can be asking and trying to penetrate those unsaid things that oftentimes, I think they really show up when things happen in silos. Yep. So an architect heard this, but someone wasn't asking enough questions and then it makes it over here. 
And you're like, dude, why do they have so many questions? And those questions and that confusion and the slow nature of that, I think, is where mistakes come from and where cost escalation comes from. So do you like to work? Do you like to be in the initial meetings with the architects and the MEPs from like day one mm -hmm. when we start planning? I know. I'm I'm so I got all kinds of issues, man. I, <laughs> I got adult ADD so bad. Like we both I, do. I love I love my broker friends. I mean, I'm nothing without those guys. Yeah. And same with the architects. But if in a perfect world you asked me, I'd want to lead it all. Okay. I go like, let's describe a perfect I'll play world. Broke, I'll play broker. I'll, I'll <laughs> play architect. I'm not going to pass anyone over. Yeah. But, you know, there's just so many things that we, I think, as the contractor kind of inherit. Yep. That get real sticky with the end user. And I go like, if we were helping make the process more pure, then it should just become more repeatable for all the other people in the constellation. Okay, well, let's just talk a little bit about the perfect project. A lot of people that listen to this are developers, they're tenants, they're businesses. Describe to somebody that's maybe thinking that has a project in the next couple of years is like, if from your world, the perfect project would be, what would be the sequence of calls that that person should make? They'd call you first maybe, and then what would happen after that? We would interview architects. Okay. We would start with the design professionals. Okay. Um, we would make strong recommendations based on their use and their goals on who we've seen do it successfully. I think a lot of people understand different asset types, um, which is only a small part of it. I think there's no substitute for experience and having been there for a long time. Who Who's selecting the MEPs, the architect or y'all? So if, if it's a really complicated manufacturing deal, yeah, you kind of want an MEP engineer in there. Yeah. You can do it in collaboration with the sub. Yeah. And so there's just different cases that require different solutions. Yep. Most of the things that we do, we prefer to do through the design build method where we're working with an architect and then we're allowing our subs to come up with engineering solutions that they'll guarantee and stamp and that'll go in for your permit package. We're, we 2020 rattled the world. It turned it upside down. And, and I, uh, I can't tell you how much respect I have, not, not only for you, but for the construction industry. Mm. It has been wild. It's been wild. Uh, I want to spend a little time on like what the, what has happened over the last few years as a contractor, mm -hmm. even from like, let's just start with how do you budget something right now? As a contractor, how has the market shifted and what are your customers expecting and how are y'all doing it in a way that's obviously profitable for your business and everybody creates a win? Because when a lot of people talk about budgeting right now, some people would say you just throw something against the wall and hope it sticks by the end of the project. But in a world of such uncertainty, how should how do y'all think about it and how are clients thinking about it when it's tough to nail down a number as things move pretty rapidly right now? Yeah. It's fascinating, man. You know, so many different twists in the path from what I feel like is when the pandemic hit to where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you that I, I believe it's getting better. Good. That we saw the worst of it in the middle of 21. Oh, yeah. That's when roofing kind of flew out the window, concrete started to go nuts. And just escalation, just going through the roof. And um, thankfully, we're not there. Some of the things that we try to do creatively, just getting outside the box during that time was, you know, let's get our subs to open up a little bit more and show us what they've assumed for labor and soft cost and profit. And let's whittle down the variable part of their proposal to the actual materials that are volatile. Mm -hmm. And that way we don't feel like it's an arbitrage and we're having to trust people when we don't really understand and we can't see. Yep. So we tried to do that for a while. Um, it was really hard at first. If you were going into a job with someone that was just used to kind of pushing it down on the contractor, yeah, it was a lot of friction. Yep. We, it, at the beginning of 22, we did $50 million worth of work in the first quarter, and I made zero. And that was 
after making a massive amount of decisions to do the right things for our clients in all kinds of places, where once it finally came through my business at the end, it was basically worth nothing. Mm. Okay, so you just said two things. You said there was more transparency with the subs. So the, my next question is, is that here to stay? Or is everybody going to, as things normalize again, are we going to, is the transparency maybe going to fold up again? It, I think we can, if predictability sets back in, then we can kind of start to trust a little bit more and we don't have to go measure at the next level. Yep. And then are there any other kind of structural changes that you can think of that's like forever going forward, construction will be done differently than it was pre-COVID? Or we, we kind of went through the chaos and things will kind of work back to the mean of how they had always been done or whether that's the GC sub relationship, how projects are bid. Is there anything that you think is just different going forward? I, I believe that it's absolutely permanently changed. Okay. And that the people that are going to really struggle are the ones that can't unlearn what they thought. Okay. That unlearning is like one of the most powerful things that you can do to keep growing. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's fascinating. Like uh, the client, the end user and the employee population is more sophisticated now than ever. And, you know, people, the marketplace just thought that the, the old school guys, the guys in my dad's generation, they just can't believe that rent's more than $3 a foot. And I'm talking to the young high horsepower brokers and they're making renewals at 10 and $12 a foot. Mm. And people question the fundamentals. And I think that that's good. Um, I was real confused about the forward sale. I didn't understand how that was good fundamentals. Uh, and people were just saying, you know, Gordo, get some land under contract and build it. Someone will take you out on the Ford. Like, it's no big deal. Uh, <laughs> That's when you know we're getting close to the top. But I do think that, that um, I do think, and look, I'm way out of my, my lane here. This is way more your world than mine. But I am an employer. And I go like, I, I'm not going to stop. No one will set a higher standard for my people than I will. Mm. And if I got to pay an extra two bucks a foot to get them what they need, we're going to do it. Yeah. And it's going to have an ROI that's going to be hard to measure. You can't, the hearts and minds of people are what, where the motivation and power is. And I think employers are waking up to that. There's yeah. something phenomenal about the pandemic where the marketplace stopped and kind of the employees had to go underwater for a little bit and when they pop back out they just started going dude i'm not going to go do that any anymore yeah i'm not going to work for nothing yeah you know i, I i'm going to seek out people that are run their business like you know a home yep and i think that's going to allow for for continued rent growth i totally agree i mean you talk about that $12 a foot number and and some of that is what people are willing to pay for. And, and we're, we're going to get there in a second with Amazon, but some of it is the amount of production that these facilities can now, like how much work you can get out of a facility. Now I was at um, the YPO global conference a few months ago and somebody gave this presentation on basically how as companies like Amazon and some of these really great companies continue to automate inside the factory. Because what we know now is they're getting done in a million square feet, what used to take them three million square feet mm -hmm. or two million. They just made a case that you could see $50 industrial rents by the early 2030s because of how much these buildings are going to produce. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that sounds crazy as we sit here at 10 and 12. Mm -hmm. But when you think of the any real estate asset class where the tenants are pumping billions of dollars into innovations of how do we get every last square centimeter of this factory productive. Mm -hmm. It's not like you can really do that in multifamily where it's like a 500 square foot one bedroom is a 500 square foot yeah. one bedroom. I guess if you're trying to shove more people into square feet, but that doesn't work for living. Um, so it's going to be really interesting as, as we talk about that rent number and, and where this and where all this could go. 
Now, to digress just a second, mm -hmm. you said if people can't unlearn a few things, mm -hmm. they're going to be a little bit in trouble. If you had to think of maybe one, two, three things that should be unlearned, if you haven't unlearned them yet, unlearn them now. Is there anything that comes to mind? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. That's why I do this, just to pump Ooh. out good questions, Gordo. Man, I can tell you, I had a massive amount of fear going into the pandemic. Oh, my worst month of my business career was March, late March, mm -hmm. early April. I We joke about it. Johnny just got to see me come in here and sulk and lick my wounds and cry about what I thought was about to happen. It was brutal. Pain, pain, it makes people do the stupidest shit. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's it's also where you learn, though. I know that's kind of my point. I think fear, the gift of fear, is wisdom, and 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 I just go like, I want to learn how to be more trusting and not let fear run the show. That's something I'm actively, personally trying to unlearn. Yeah, it's weird. It's I didn't know where we were gonna go today, you know, and so I got, I got all my little my books and the things I'm studying, the places that I'm going, that I'm thirsty and seeking, you know? And um, this idea about a kingdom, Christ talks about a kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. I go, what is that? What is the kingdom? Thy kingdom come. And all I've learned how to do so far in a non-judgmental way is listen to my inner dialogue and the lies and the fear that I tell myself. Yeah. And I just try to catch it and just ask the Lord to remove it. That's the enemy. He wants to confuse you. That's progress for me. Yeah. Because I wasn't even aware enough to catch it and release it. Yeah. I'd go straight into my fear about this, or I need to go fix this, or this needs to be more perfect. And I was just trying so hard with good intention but really motivating out of a massive amount of fear during that time and i think we're better off i think i think the whole world is a better place because of it yep. i think we've learned a lot and it was tough but yeah i just want to i want to change my mindset and and be open to when i'm growing and the chaos of it and not fight it so much. I'm with you. I mean, one of my mentors tells me all the time, like when you're scared and you're confused, the devil is doing his job. He's the prince of confusion. Jesus is a prince of peace. And yeah. So wherever state you're in, you kind of know where you're leaning right now. Um, and it's a hundred percent of the time, all the time, when I'm scared and confused, somebody's gotten a hold of me. And that ain't good. And that's where you make stupid decisions or short term decisions rather than lifelong decisions that build a kingdom. Yeah. You can't build a kingdom thinking in the moment. Yeah, I know. It's brick by brick, day by day. I love that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of kingdoms, Amazon's built not so bad of one, <laughs> if anybody's heard about them. Um, and, and we can, and we can, we don't have to speak to Amazon specific, but there's a lot of tenants that are starting to, Amazon maybe sets the bar of, mm -hmm. um, and again, I know, to the extent that you can talk, what are you seeing now? Now the, the, the industrial world's just changed considerably. You're building now. Yeah. You walk into an Amazon facility, it's a damn miracle. You walked into a 2007 warehouse, it was a box, like you said, with some Ding. flickering lights yeah. and a bunch of forklift sounds. What, uh, what, is the, the, what is the box of the future looking like? What are people asking and, and how are these jobs getting to where interior is four times what the shell costs? Yeah, one of the efficiencies that you kind of alluded to earlier is just, you know, the, the, the deal we did, they added 3 million square feet of usable square footage inside the million square foot building. So when... When you're Say a, that again. They added 3 million square feet of usable square footage inside the building. How the hell do you do that? So we built structural mezzanines for the robotic field, <laughs> and they put <laughs> racking in. It was four stories tall that had floors. Okay. And so 
So how tall? What's the clear height on a building like that? That one was forty. Okay. Are we still going to be going up? Is is forty the the top? Or are you thinking? I don't know what the math is on all that. We going to sixty, or when does this stop? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Um, I do think that um, it's getting taller and taller. That's what we know. Yep. Um, it's getting more automated, and just kind of. What I like to do is just kind of, regardless if it's Amazon or anyone that's going into e-commerce, kind of go back to the consumer. That's where I have the best relationship with Amazon. I seriously. Does your front doorstep look like mine? Yeah. Just a pyramid of boxes I by know. the end of the day? Like we adopted two homeless families and something didn't show up and it was kind of like this. We had to go to the store to go buy little toy cars for this track that we bought. And it was like a real inconvenience. We had done a lot of preparation <clears throat> with ordering and it comes with such certainty that our life is disrupted now by like a couple of hours. <laughs> I, uh, I have a beautiful home. I live in East Dallas and, and uh, I took a stab at doing residential uh, construction. I remodeled my own house. Oh. It was built in 1938, and it's it's uh, it's it's beautiful. But it'll be the one and only house that I ever do. I love commercial. Yeah, <laughs> it's very different. Um, and we have all these amazing light fixtures in my house. This is the little e-commerce story that I love to tell. Yeah, one of my least favorite things in the world to do is to go take a light bulb to Home Depot and and like stare at all these boxes and try to like retrain my brain to see and read where I need to find this candela, you know, antique globe looking, you know. And so I, I literally have a small inventory in my garage of every light bulb that I own, <laughs> and they're all on subscribe and save. And I don't ever have to do anything again in terms of ordering a light bulb from my house. I just go replace them. And I have five kids, and so I, I don't even replace them anymore. I get the five kids to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but my point there is we're we're never going back. Yeah. And so the e-commerce and the consumer market, I believe what happened to our business during the pandemic is it demonstrated how solid that was. Whatever socioeconomic group or gender or race you were in uh you converted during the pandemic to e-commerce yeah and i just think we're at the beginning stages of that being a global phenomenon that's going to go for a really long time we're doing nike's facility we love these big complicated e-commerce jobs we're really good at them we've been tracking with amazon since the beginning you know, those guys are great to work with. If the audience is trying to figure out if I have an inside track on that, you know, like then they don't understand how Bezos really runs his business. You know, <laughs> Everything is designed to go fast because there's just an arm's length of decisions from everyone else. Yep. And it's just fascinating. But we have a great relationship with them. But I don't call one person. I don't have like some inside track. Right. I never know when they're going to call. But when they do, they get my full attention and we just go kill it for them. Yep. That's, why did they want you to then go into, why did they care that you uh, not only did interiors, but did the whole ground up? What was the the reasoning there besides, obviously, they loved working with you? I think you asked this question earlier. I'll try to dovetail them together. But did you say, when do you actually go get into the weeds of your business? Mm -hmm. Well, five years ago. Oh, so you do that still? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love to build things. Yeah. I really do. I I think I'm building a business now that's about building into people. So that's just like uh, a force multiplier on the word build. Oh, yeah. Um, but I was an excellent project manager. I think that's in the, the root system of Gordon Highlander, that pursuit of excellence. And so... Amazon showed up for the first time five years ago in our relationship. And I know because my wife was pregnant with our fifth child, our only singleton. I have two sets of twin twins. Boys. I have that. I have that <laughs> note. Oh, my gosh. I know. I have identical twin boys that are 17. 
uh, fraternal twin boys that are nine. Oh my gosh. And a five year old little girl. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we get to put a picture on the podcast, but I'll send you one from we'll this morning. We'll put a picture on the podcast. Yeah. Birdie and I at breakfast. That's awesome. Um, Jilly was pregnant with Birdie and Amazon came to a deal. It was a spec office that we were doing in South Dallas. It was a million square feet. Jeez. And um, Amazon came, took the spec office that we were building, and in six weeks, we did a finish out for Amazon. And well, so that's fast. That's a million square feet in six weeks. Oh my God. Yeah. And one of the greatest stories there, a young man, leader at Gordon Highlander now, D Cash was my project manager. And um, I showed up to the job trailer and got the download on the scope of work. Deke put his hands up and he said, how are we going to do this? And I said, okay, here's the deal. You ever put your hands up on me again, you're fired. <laughs> Call your wife. You're not going home tonight. <laughs> and he looked at me like, what the hell? <laughs> We went to Office Depot and we bought butcher paper and we rolled it out and covered the entire inside of the trailer. And I broke the job down into the 16 trade divisions. We went through the critical path and the scope of work for each one. And we realized we didn't have a big enough concrete subcontractor and a big enough electrician. And so we went and got two concrete subs, two electricians. And I was on that job for six weeks while my wife was in the last trimester of her pregnancy. <laughs> you know, and I said, babe, do you, do you want a house in the Pacific Northwest someday? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, well, what are you saying? I go, well, it's not this job so much as it is this opportunity. Yep. And that's the really cool part. I was in fellowship on, on Saturday and they were talking about time and, and we were talking about Kronos, which is kind of chronological time, and then Kairos, which is spiritual opportunity. That's like when time becomes vertical. And I go like, I don't know how to prove it. It's, it's, it's an experience. But as a business leader, there's been either jobs or times with people and just situations that are in the story that you're going to try to narrate for your employees about where you guys finished this year. Yep. It's the storytelling is the language of the heart. That's what ultimately connects people. It's stories. And so that story I knew was going to be really important. It it's it's still a big part of my story with D Cash. It's it's the first Amazon job that we ever did. And that was a prototype that they hadn't built yet. So not only did they not know me, they didn't know how to build their own prototype. And so we demonstrated and worked with them on how to do it. And, <clears throat> and they just got this idea about us then that <clears throat> they would give us their prototypes and we'd help them figure out their business. And so that just built a massive amount of trust and confidence. And so the, mil the million square foot deal that we did at DFW, that was another prototype for them soft lines which is women's clothing and um it's been a wonderful relationship everyone knows amazon and they know that we've been successful and they like to kind of connect our success to amazon but this year amazon represents less than five percent of the body of work that gordon highlander will do wow okay we we can't gloss over what you just said you go to home depot you get a bunch of what you what kind of paper is it? Butcher paper. Butcher paper. That's is that the kind of waxy paper? What's well, no, it's just like it's like uh, it's like paper in a roll. Okay, we get a we get a bunch of butcher paper. We we pull an all nighter, and then you said I think you broke the project into sixteen components. Does every project? Well, let me start there. Does every project have sixteen components, or just this one did? No, every project when you work with an architect has their uh, CSI codes. Okay, and those are your those are the ways that you break up the mechanical from the electrical to the plumbing to the drywall to the millwork. So you break it up into your sixteen components, and then you said it was your job that night to figure out the critical path to get all of these done. 
Can you just go a little deeper into like what happened that night? That's probably like a, that'll become a legendary story for your company if it's not already. Like what happened? What happened is through rigorous planning and um, a massive amount of critical thinking and analysis, we identified our problems. Got it, to get it done. And I think the biggest mistake a contractor could ever make is to think that there isn't one in a job. The biggest mistakes we made as a developer but we, at one point when we were doing more residential owned our own contractor, and this was probably, this is a hundred percent on my shoulders. Everybody wants to see sticks and dirt start flying. If there's any wisdom I ever learned, and it, I probably have a lot more to learn is like the more time you can spend in pre-con and pre-dev mm -hmm. figuring out your problems. One, the project will go faster with less headaches and everything else. But, um, Thinking about, I, I think the best contractors and developers I've ever met spend the time up front before they ever see a piece of dirt move. And the worst ones are just wanting to see dirt move and then they deal with all the headaches after. Yeah. That's unbelievable. We call it the launch. Okay. And it's because a rocket burns 90% of its fuel just getting off the ground. And so that's the imagery behind it. Mm. So it's not finished strong. It's start strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finish well. Yeah. I mean, that's our that's our slogan, finish well. We we didn't like finish strong because I think it implies that you didn't start strong. And all the magic, I think, in that careful preparation, there's a lot of little anecdotal things every day of pre-construction saves you 10 days of construction. But there is an impulsivity that people have or the marketplace has. The Good. biggest mistakes I've ever had when people push me to start too soon. Finishing well, uh, if anybody's ever built anything at all, it's usually like punch list and those final days yeah. that are the most brutal. I How know. do you think about punch lists in those final days? Because I think, again, another separator between great contractors and good contractors mm -hmm. is those last few days of getting the yeah. little things done. I know. We, we talk about uh, running the hurdles. And everyone thinks the CO in the final is the last hurdle. No. But it's the eighth. And there's <laughs> two more. What are the other two? The other two is finishing the punch list. Okay. And then the last one is just the total management of the contractual obligations. Yeah. The liens, the final payment. Yeah, yeah. And tying it all the way off. Um, okay. So <clears throat> Where do we stand in the market today from a, like, what are you seeing now? Just purely like it's 2022, uh, our, our friend Jerome Powell up at the fed said to hell with cheap, uh, uh, 0% interest rates where we're going back to the old days. Things are obviously a little, I wouldn't, I would, eh, I guess we call it chaotic depending on what asset class and market you're in, but like. What are you seeing now from a contractor standpoint mm -hmm. as we sit today on December 15th? Today, Gordon Highlander has a $325 million backlog that'll get it fully executed in, in 2023. Let's go, baby. And that's, you know, that's like 35% more than we'll do this year. Yep. Um, our big industrial jobs are all build a suits and they're for end users. I'm really, really excited about that. I think that's a combination of all of our skill sets in one package. Um, a build a suit end user isn't focused on interest rates as much because they're not exiting and they don't worry about a cap rate. Mm. You know, I've heard, and I don't. I mean, I'm. I don't want to play dumb, but I don't totally understand what pencils down means. I hate that phrase. All I know is that everyone says it, and I just think to myself, just a bunch of followers following followers. Yeah. There's going to be good fundamentals that come back into this business because of the slowdown, and I'm excited about that. Yep. Things weren't making sense. There's just a massive amount of in-migration and demand, <clears throat> and so I'm worried that 
If pencils stay down too long and absorption keeps going, we're going to have another little problem that I see us uniquely positioned to be able to solve that through build a suit activity. Yep. Um, I think the the modern workplace has changed, and there's a lot of old obsolete office buildings out there. If their floor plates are the right size, they're ripe for conversion to multi. Uh, specifically in Dallas, I would love to see density increase with multifamily in, in the CBD and for us to have those things that other major cities have, all that cultural richness and the walkability in downtown. So I think we actually have a chance at pulling that off now, yeah. which I'm excited about. Office developers are going to keep building really cool office buildings. Yep, They're going to have to if they're going to work. And I think big corporate headquarter relocations are going to look for real modern office space. Yep, Their end user uh, requirements and their employee base want wellness. They, they want natural light. They want to be outside. They want all these things. And so developers in the past kind of built things that work for them and they kind of forced the office market to fit into their box. And, you know, there's a, there's a, Crow Holdings is building a mass timber uh, building in Frisco that's going to be out of this world cool. That's awesome. There's just going to be great development. Um, and then also, too, I just still think there's just so much money that the money's going to have to go to work. Right. And so people are just going to have to figure out how to get used to a different spread. Yeah. 2020 and 2021, I mean, I'm not saying they they probably shouldn't. If you're upset that we're off the highs of 2021, then I don't think you fully understand economics. I mean, that was just straight up into the, I mean, it was just bananas. I think we'll look, 2021 was the wildest damn year. It was fun. Yeah. I mean, there was, there's money going everywhere, but it was like all things, um, gravity sets in and we must come back down to earth. And like you said, I think it's going to wash out a lot of the the posers or the fakers that probably shouldn't have been in the industries mm -hmm. that they just easily got in and it, yeah. it, it and it creates strength and durability for the folks that are in it for the long term and truly know what they're doing credit's going to be a big deal yeah and so people that just were leaning over their ski tips too much it's just those are the fundamentals i think that maybe we're a little out of whack you said you do, you know, really nice office in industrial buildings, but you've also, you mentioned old Parkland, uh, you've mentioned some class AA corporate interiors. Is there anything different that happens between building a really nice office in an industrial building versus a really nice office in an old Parkland? Uh, minus, you know, how you get into the property and all the security and everything. Like what, what's different about the actual build outs themselves? We're doing the Neiman's headquarters right now. Okay. And, uh, the the level of design and just the sheer beauty in what we're going to build for them is just way different yeah there's different economics to it you know um <clears throat> an industrial space that this hasn't changed at all you're kind of counting how many times that fork truck goes in and out of that truck the amazon job they said you know we we make like $750,000 a day out of this facility. So when you're thinking about how to speed the project up, keep that in the back of your mind. And I go, first thing I go like, let's, let's rip the roof off. And they go, why? And I go, well, the slowest thing I have to do is to meet the energy code requirements. The roof doesn't meet it. And we got to go stick pin uh, insulation underneath the bottom side of the deck. And I can rip it off and put it on new and then it doesn't slow any of the production down on the inside. How much is that? Three million bucks. So, you know, three million bucks is just four days of production for them. Mm -hmm. How much time does it save us? It saves us four weeks. Do it. Yeah. So a little bit different. Yeah, Neiman yeah. Marcus, <laughs> it's 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 more museum grade. It's like it's about the experience of the office space. Yep. It's the light fixtures and the design and all the things that go into what I think is trying to create this, this magic and the human connection and the experience that the person has in that office. On a deal like that, are y'all, do y'all do the interior design at your firm or do you partner with an amazing interior designer and how do y'all work together when you're building that detailed and intricate of a space? 
that one's an easy one f- uh, for me. When I'm talking about wanting to play architect and broker and everything, I just yeah. I'm so deeply rooted in my origins. My OG is is industrial. So for the audience, you know, <laughs> I'm not talking about <laughs> Neiman Marcus's headquarters. Yeah, yeah, I mean the design professionals are magicians. Yep, it's really in their hands. They're the ones, and and then the real beauty in it is that collaboration between the end user and the architect and how they get that vision out. Oftentimes the end user doesn't have the vocabulary or the muscle memory to think and work the way the architect does. Yeah. So really, really good architects, I think are great at pulling that out. And when you're designing a space like that, first your budget, you're, you're, you're coming up with an estimate, you're giving it to them. I'm not saying these companies have endless budgets. How do you think about change orders along the way? Because I have to imagine in something like that, when a change order happens at that level of detail, it's not just a hundred bucks here or there. There's big. How do you kind of set the tone before the project starts of how something like that actually works? Because that's where a lot of the pain happens. It's like, well, you said it would cost this. It's like, well, yeah, but we didn't. We weren't going to put the gold toilet in the the women's restroom. You really, you really try hard to just only put high level budgets together through the design process. And then you work that design process together collaboratively to a point yeah. where, you know, most of the decisions have been worked out. Yeah. And then after that, it's typically owner or architect led. It's not because we forgot something. Yep. So there, there's more of a memorialization. Yep. On some of these super fast moving industrial deals, I mean, you just gotta go. Yeah. Any it's not worth it to to like you just said, to wait a f- even days, weeks. Everything's costing you seven hundred and fifty thousand a day if if you're Amazon. Yeah. Oh, what it would like be like to be Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> uh you think differently. I do? <laughs> well, you would if you were like Amazon. I mean Oh, it's a different... Just the vision and foresight, just the way it's changed our world is just, it's amazing. Well, you, uh, maybe you, you have an opinion on this, you don't. The big headlines of 2022 were, you know, Amazon's not building as much, but then I, you know, it. I think those are more headlines because then you go to some of these conferences I've been to, it's like, no, they net absorbed an additional 15 million. They grew 15 million square feet this year. Uh, but then you hear they, you know, decommitted from projects here and there. Um, I guess from your perspective, and I know the markets that you're in, did you have any of the impact of Amazon slowing down or was that more of a headline narrative than reality? We had one deal that was just kind of, it felt like it was stacked like a house of cards. Yeah. And that deal didn't move and I couldn't figure out whether it was Amazon or not. And then, oh, you didn't know if it was them yet? No, I, did, I, I said, no, I knew it was them, but I didn't know if if it was the, the situational pressure that they were dealing with or the fact that, you know, the the guy putting the deal together just thought he was going to get rich. Yeah. Um, You know, when the news broke, it was funny, you know, like we were like, oh, we were kind of bummed out, you know? And then the next week they called and said, will you go national with us? <laughs> you know, I'm like, wait a minute, that's a different signal. Yep. And well, you know, the world is full of lies. You can't listen to really what the world says. No kidding. And 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 it, and it wasn't as bad as everyone feared. Yeah. Um, we started helping them underwrite and look at how to make their buildings safer. And we helped them through some budgeting around building safe rooms, and and they kept us busy in different ways. And we're still moving forward with uh, a certain product type finish out yeah all right we're gonna spin the uh <clears throat> the last leg of this awesome conversation on just leadership culture kind of all the, the the really good stuff and so maybe we could just start with um how you think about not only your legacy there and and how you've thought about servant leadership but how that's kind of starting to permeate the organization because when i started the conversation from afar 
the thing that I think about when I think about y'all, I actually think about y'all as a contractor second. I think about y'all's culture a lot first. It's it just um, it exudes it, it 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 outshines you, which is a great thing. So, like, how have you thought about all this? It, it doesn't it it doesn't happen by accident. No, um, just just personal kind of my personal Kairos moments. Um, I was lucky enough to go to a Jesuit high school in Dallas. Okay. And there's something really powerful about the Ignatian doctrine. And Jesuit demonstrated a way. Um, we had a motto. It was to be a man for others. And so I was a young man, and I was imprinted with this idea of service. And so I'm grateful for that. I think that's like deeply embedded in my heart. Wow. Um, um, the older I get, the more grateful I am. Yep. I was just a young <laughs> idiot. <laughs> but it gave me a foundation, you know? Yeah. And then um, I failed at my first marriage. And it wasn't until... Um, I really started to get hungry and ask the big questions about life and my purpose and wanted to explore my faith a little more than I felt like the Catholic Church allowed. It's not that they did or didn't. It just was my relationship with it. Yeah. Um, that I had my conversion. And so... Um, I just remember Jill showed up in my life and I didn't think I deserved it, you yep. know, and I was in counseling, preparing to get married and the counselor had asked, have you reconciled your first marriage? And to this day, that's still a high conflict relationship. And I knew there was no way that I'd be able to do it. Yeah. And I thought it was my job. And I just didn't understand how <clears throat> reconciliation worked. And it's so basic. I tried to orchestrate my own reconciliation. My little joke about it is that I tried to use a Q-tip to clean my own ass up. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's ugly imagery, <laughs> but no, that's I, how dumb I am. Yeah. And then. And reconciliation while you're on that, there's a lot to go in there is um, forgiveness uh, in a lot of ways is setting a prisoner free and realizing that the person you set free is yourself yeah or resenting resentment is a poison that you drink that you think hurts someone else but it hurts you right and then i go like where does forgiveness really come from and that was the act of surrendering and asking the lord to be my king yep i knew i couldn't pull it off there were awful things that i had done yep they were not forgivable yep they wouldn't have been by her, and I don't blame her, you know, but that's when the Lord got me. Boom. And so that was in the first year of Gordon Highlander, I started my divorce. I had a guy die on the job when a client pushed me to get started before I should have. Um, I went through a high-conflict divorce. My, my identical twins were 18 months old, and... That was the inside out work. That and started. it was 07 heading into 08. Right. I, I finalized my divorce in August of 08 with a payout on a marriage that only lasted 18 months. And the economy flew off a cliff. So, you know, what I would tell my team at the time is that um, I didn't know how to prove it, but that God wanted to use Gordon Highlander. Um, 
we had chinks in our armor that made us undeniably authentic. Yep. But they were the very chinks that people spend their whole career trying to avoid. And for whatever reason, they all happened at first. <laughs> at the first. <laughs> <laughs> you just started. Just I'm like Magneto, you know. I can, <laughs> I can attract precious gems and pitchforks and hatchets all at the same time. I love and it. so that's that that is the undeniable part of my story that then I tried to kind of carefully weave into the organization. Mm. I um I um I I feel like I'm a student of human behavior and and I'm I'm hungry to learn and and unlearn <laughs> and um we were cruising along i really um there's still at the beginning there was still so much of my ego all over the place i can see it more clearly now i had a lot of resistance or kind of uh, revulsions to things and and i used my sense of humor to make fun of them like we're not gonna have values where i go buy a poster from Michaels that says courage and it's a wave crashing on the rocks. <laughs> we're just not even going to write it down because we're going to live it out. Yeah. And so that little messy origin and the, the people that were with me then are still at Gordon Highlander. And I will tell you that the, the adoptership that it's this, this cultural phenomenon that is such a blessing and, and a privilege to be a part of is way bigger than me. Yep. It's, it's, I believe that, that, that companies have a soul. It's an, it's an organization of people. It's organic. It, it, it has a soul. And what is competing with the soul and what I've learned is the ego. The ego is full of attachments and revulsions and that's how you know it's there yeah and so in in like 2016 i started to realize why wouldn't we write this down mm. and so amazing partner uh showed up around that time and and uh mark hernandez with 22 brands is who we've been working with since then and he and i are more, more like brothers now than anything and we just love, I think, ideating over all this and figuring out the authentic ways to put it in the business. But um, we did a we did a workshop then, and and uh, that's when we codified our our mission statement. And so, that's a big part of being a Gordon Highlander um, to build a legacy, helping others reach their God given potential. Yep. And I teach a cultural training class to every single employee that gets hired at Gordon Highland. Really? It's the very first thing that they do. So what does that look like? That's me talking about the rich story of my family and the imagery and what it means, symbolism, the colors, the tartan, you know, the red stack. Uh, it is me confessing my faith and asking for permission to be able to talk openly about it. Wow. I'm not asking anyone to change. Uh, it's foolish for me to think that they they could with me, you know? <laughs> I think the only thing that I'm responsible to do is to share my testimony and be unashamed about it. Yep. And so um, we talk about archetypes, the principal archetype of Gordon Highlander is to be a servant. That's the business that we're in. And so then we talk about legacy. Yep. We, I deconstruct the whole mission statement for everyone. When I told my dad about my mission statement, he said, it doesn't say anything about construction. And I go, dad, it says to build. And then I do this little exercise that I hope helps everyone memorize it i wanted it to be easy to memorize and then we built it in a way that we can deconstruct it so to build what a legacy and then i ask everyone what do you think a legacy is 
And so for me, I just talk about eternity. The pursuit of excellence is always just out of my reach, but I can't stop reaching for it. And in my little dyslexic way, that's how I know it's there. The legacy of what? Helping others. You know, that's our Jesuit story, to be a man for others, right? And then helping others do what? Reach their God-given potential. And that's what I tell everyone. If I am not careful and I let my self-worth run the show, I care about how hard I work and what other people think of me. And I forget that I'm made in God's image and that I'm invaluable to him. And I tell every single employee that they're invaluable, that the world says they're replaceable, but not to me. That is unbelievable. <laughs> Gordo. And I'm assuming that this had to, even this, this class that you teach, it didn't start that way. Mm -mm. Did you design this on your own? Oh, Did no. Did somebody help you create this? <laughs> well. <clears throat> and if I come to work for you, how long, is this a full day? How did, because they leave there and then they start it at Gordon and, and that obviously continues on. Um, how, how does it continue on after that first meeting with you, which, I mean, you just knocked my damn socks off. <laughs> I'm trying to catch my breath right now. Uh Mandy Piercy is the second employee at Gordon Highlander, and she's the vice president of culture and talent. Um, we have a lot of people that are in overhead positions that are dedicated to the organization outside of being a contractor. We have a person that's dedicated to all of our subcontractors so that they know that we believe that they're invaluable too and that that's the spirit in which we're trying to lead ourselves and the entire organization. It's also a great filter for business development and the sales team. It's hard. We're, we, we love to win. Yeah. Um, but at what cost, you know, yep. the greatest relationships that we have are the people that see the value in us too. How, um, and I'm assuming you just answered the question, but if I'm if I'm somebody young about to get in this industry, and obviously some of the wisdom you learn in life, you you got to learn from the pain and and growing older and seeing a lot of things, and maybe it starts out with what you said about Jesu Jesuit, but there's a lot of people that are going to be graduating college. There's just a lot of young people in the industry that are getting in. You know what do you what do you tell them? There's a there's a great saying um, when when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Mm. And the hardest, the most bravest places a person can go is 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 on the inside. And I don't know. I just like my seventeen year old boys. I'm like boys. You have a judgment bias that you don't even understand yet. It happens so fast, you're just unaware of it. Yeah. But just at least encouraging them to consider, you know, what is a bias? What are those things that shape the way you think? And there's just, there's just, I will tell you one of the greatest stories, my best friend in life is the COO. The, really? And Of your company? We met in the fourth grade. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. He was the, we were co-captains of the wrestling team at Jesuit. I was the student body president. And he was the vice president. Okay. The world says you can't work with your friends, but I go, why not? Yeah. Friendship is built on the greatest tenets in relationships. And I go, that's what we want to have at Gordon Highlander. Uh, my other super good friend from high school, one of the smartest kids I know, he's the chief strategy officer. <laughs> My best friend Brad, he he uh, he left after five years and thought he could take what we were doing and take it into the marketplace and go lead it for himself. And it didn't work out. I was unaware of this. We were having lunch two years after the fact, and he looked at me and he said, "I I made a mistake." 
and I asked him if he had cheated on his wife. I didn't understand. And he said, no, I made a professional mistake. And then I, then it got weird. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> and people were hurt when he left. Yeah. And I knew I needed to be really careful and explain what pain does to people's memory. Yep. Brad, leaving hurt. That hurt. But Brad did not hurt us in a conscious way. There's a real difference. He loves us. And it's painful. And I'm thankful that I had the foresight to do that because he told me that day, I figured it out. And I go, what? And he said, I don't care what we do. I just want to do it together. Mm. And so that is a rich moment in our story that you can't make up. That's a part of the deep stitching in our fabric. Yep. We are on a pilgrimage together to a place that we'll never get to on earth. Yep. The desire that we have for permanency is the very thing that life never provides. There's a certain loneliness to life. And when you can do it with other people that you want to do it with, that's the real magic. So he came back. He came back. How did we have to talk? So he, he left. <laughs> then he realized he made a mistake. How long after that lunch until y'all were back in the saddle together? And and how did you handle it? Did you at first think, well, let me make sure this is going to work? Like, how does somebody come back, especially into a place of leadership? A lot of the things that Brad and I wrestled over, and, and it was it's a funny story, that we would do it very, we had gotten used to fighting with each other and we didn't care what anyone else thought and so i'll never forget one time richie said when y'all do that shit it reminds me of when my parents used to fight when i was a kid <laughs> <laughs> you know like mom and dad are fighting again <laughs> but the very things that he was challenging me on were the things that we actually had to put in our business after he left yep and then we grew like a weed and so um, it wasn't easy. Some people wanted to withhold the right to buy into it until they saw what they felt like were some of the changes that they wanted to see. Um, it's helpful, I think, it, what I've always felt like has been very helpful and, and such a huge privilege is I don't have any partners. And so I get to make the decisions, but I've always been so careful with that. Yeah. I have I tell everyone I'm not afraid to make the decision, but a lot of times I don't have to because I've figured out either how to hold the tension long enough so that we know as a group or we do it in a collaborative way. And so it was going and socializing some of that with the key people and then convincing them that this could be a real powerful part of our story. And then ultimately, I think one of the greatest gifts that you can give someone as a leader is teaching others how to put themselves in other people's shoes. Mm. And I just said, with all due respect, if you had made the same mistake, how would you want me to receive you? And it wasn't until people could make it personal that they understood how important it was that's grace yeah you said pain does something to people's memory i felt that because i tend to distort my memory of things when things have been traumatic mm -hmm. what do you mean by that that you could also kind of use that comment that we made around resentment for that too that somehow there is a bondage that we have with our pain. And if we're not careful, we, we become histrionic and we tell ourselves the same thing over and over again for so long that it becomes a life of its own that we can't really cope with. Yep. Yep. And, and, it, and it's okay for things to be painful. 
But people want to take painful moments and make it someone else's fault. The hardest part of the inside out work that we have to do is when we sit in our own shit and realize what our part in it was. Well, that's what you said. The bravest thing you can do is go on, go to the inside. And we all get to that point in our journey at different times, but it typically has come just like humans are good at after a disaster of some type. Yeah, I'm just such a dummy. I'm like, dude, I just like, oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> there I go again. If people listening to this knew some of the just <laughs> bombs I've put myself through, just stupid things that um, maybe one day I'll share them, but it, you typically hear, you go to the inside when things are in free fall because that's really the only place left to go. Mm. You've, you've, you've already reached for everything on earth and, yeah. and it didn't work. I would like to tell a sad story if it's okay. I, mean, I, I, I think that as I have learned, you don't get to pick and choose really. Yeah. And if you try to live with your hands open, <clears throat> God does put other people's pain in your path. And so we had a superintendent commit suicide on Thanksgiving week. Mm. And three weeks prior to that, he took a mental health day. I heard about it secondhand, and I decided to move in. It was concerning. And um, his name is uh, Jared Gardner. His daughter is getting married today. Just super painful. Mm. Um, he had failed at marriage and was in an unhealthy relationship he had a heart like a lion and i believe had some codependency issues where he was trying to make an unhappy person happy he thought he could fix it and well, that changed and he didn't have the tools to manage the pain he became manic about how he was wronged. And we moved in, we tried to help him. We got him into counseling and, and we invested a lot in terms of people knowing what was going on and trying to love on him and tell him, you know, failure is an event, it's not a person. And just equip him with the tools to deal with his own inner dialogue. And I'm not a hater. <laughs> But I hate suicide. Yeah. I just know Jared didn't have the tools to deal with his thoughts yep. and his pain, and it became too real. And somehow he convinced himself it'd be better if he was gone. Yep. God. As a as an employer, and I think this is a I think this is a good way to bring this all back. Some people would tell you, like, are you crossing an HR boundary yeah. when you go help a person and put them in counseling? Or when you start treating people like people and like family or just like people mm -hmm. instead of robots or numbers on a, on a spreadsheet? How do you think about where the company... And I, and I think I know your answer, what your answer is mm -hmm. going to be, but like, what do you tell other business owners and leaders that are on the fence of, again, the world tells you all the wrong things. The world would say, you can't, you can't reach out like that. You got to call your HR director and make sure it all is going to check out mm -hmm. when in the end of the day, all we are is people that are showing up at work but we tended to make it feel like work has to be this totally different way in which we live our lives because there's all these legal ramifications. Like how have you, I don't even know what I'm asking. Like how have you taken that boundary down and said to hell with that? Like I'm gonna, it's all one thing. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna, the same way I'm at home is the same way I'm gonna lead at work. And if you don't like it, come at me. I mean, how have you thought through that? Because you are a unique leader in today's world. I think about um, just, you know, 
the way the world lies about HR and it needing to be this thing of compliancy. You know, I don't know. No one shows up to inspect my HR. But I have this idea, like I play the court of law in my mind. And I go like, what's the right thing for Jared? And you know what? If I make a mistake trying to do the right thing and I let love be the currency that I'm dealing with when I'm dealing with my people, mm. then I'm willing to take those mistakes. There's risk in everything that we do. I'm a contractor. I take a massive, massive amount of risk every day. Um, if I if I focus on the risk, then I miss, I think, the real opportunity to serve. And um, yeah, I mean, I would listen to this. I was uh, I was in Seattle at the University of Washington with my identical twins on a college tour when I found out that Jared took his life. And I just kept thinking about all my people. How should they hear that this has happened? And I just knew right away, it's not an email. And so we pause what we're doing, and I have a FaceTime call with all 110 employees, and we mourn and weep together. It was a sad day. I can feel the gravity of the situation. In the weirdest way, it's one of the greatest privileges of being a leader. The shepherd goes after the lost sheep. And I have to work hard on being a good lamp. And that's what we're trying to teach. That's part of what's in the fabric of Gordon Highlander. We're trying to activate the inside out job that a leader has to do. This has been one of the best. If there was ever going to be a four year anniversary episode, this was this was the one. This has been absolutely incredible. Well, thank you, man. We had to reschedule this a lot. Isn't that funny? I'm glad we did. God's hands have been on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> he wanted this to be an anniversary special. This was unbelievable. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming out today. I'm um, encouraged by what you're doing. I'm very encouraged by what you're doing. I actually have some work to do now. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Yeah. So thanks again, man. Thank you.